Welcome to the Love Fly podcast. It's Paul Tizard, fear of flying coach for the last 25 years. And today's podcast, I thought I'd jump on before the actual interview itself, because I'm going to be talking to somebody I've known for a long time called uh, Dr. Paul Barber or Professor Paul Barber. And Paul is a specialist and well-written and well-known in the Gestalt field of therapy. Now, the reason why I thought he would be interesting to come on to this podcast is because many years ago, probably 10, 12 maybe longer, he was actually my therapist for a good number of years. And the reason I mention that is that people often say to me, how do you stay so calm? You seem calm, uh, you always seem calm on the podcast and stuff, so I'm not, this is my opinion, this is what people are saying to me. And where's that come from, you know? And obviously there's an element of natural sort of personality there as well, but we all have our own inner turmoil and stuff that we have to deal with. And I just thought it would be quite interesting to recognise the fact that sometimes we do need to go to these people who are specialists in talking therapies or whatever else that you need. And, and it's not a bad thing because that can help you get yourself back on track and to sort out your own inner demons and things that are stopping you from being the best version of yourself. So that's why I started seeing Paul Barber probably back in 2009 and saw him for a good four years or so before he disappeared off to Bucharest and uh, luckily we've reconnected and now our relationship is kind of a bit of a hybrid between coaching, supervision and sometimes more therapeutic because Gestalt is very much about dealing with the here and now and what's in front of you and being present and being authentic with who you are and who you want to be and so he's often sort of switching between roles because that's what's required from me so just thought I'd do that little preamble before the actual podcast, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. And today's guest is Dr. Paul Barber, who I have known for many years because he's actually been my own coach and supervisor. Uh, even tried to escape by moving to Bucharest, but I tracked him down virtually. And yeah. Paul has agreed. <laughs> uh, Paul has agreed to come on here and talk about I hope well lots of things I hope, but in particular I was interested in the the Gestalt approach to fear of flying and anxieties and whatnot, whatever we end up talking about. So welcome, Paul. Hi there. Tell us a little bit about your background in terms okay. of, you know, how you've got to where you are now. Way back, school, art college, Merchant Navy Tugs in Manchester Docks, then mental nurse, uh, mental nurse teacher, worked inside psychiatry for many years, running, running groups, uh, mm -hmm. doing, doing one-to-one one, one work, but also therapeutic community practice work where you have lots of large groups. I think it happened because I was walking towards my fears. I was fearful of people. I was fearful of being seen. I was fearful of becoming high, high profile. So I, I, I walked towards my fears. That's, that's where the growth is. Mm. And I, I found myself going more and more towards person-facing work. Then later became academic and ran courses in, in personal growth. And uh, now I've retired after 50 years of running consultancies and practices and things. And I still see the occasional victim. But uh, apart from that, I am really retired. Trying to be retired, but not, not doing very well, is it? I'm trying really bloody hard, but I have all these things that are called interests, and these interests draw me out. Mm. And if I have fears, and I'm still walking towards them, which I am, then I'm, I'm doing tough things like this, podcasts upon fear. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm grateful for it. So I've mentioned this word gestalt, and... Yeah. Some people, I think it's probably quite well known in certain circles, but I, I would imagine, I could be wrong, that people in the fear of flying community may not have thought about this as a way of helping their own fears. I'm, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Maybe we're saying, saying something, something about Gestalt, because Gestalt is a dialogue with, with whatever you're fearful of, in many ways. Uh, fear. What is fear? What, what does fear mean? Symbolize. Like when I was young, way, way back, and I was raised in this, this, this rather mad family where my grandparents weren't speaking. My father had died two months before I was born. My mother was hysterical, anxious in mourning. 
And I had this reoccurring dream right up until my probably age six or seven, where I was inside this car. The car came along the road fine. Then it hit a bridge and it kept going up. And inside the car, I, I could see the world getting smaller and smaller and the car going further and further up. And I always woke up. But I woke up feeling ungrounded, fearful, ex expressing fears. Mm. Now, it's quite likely that dream was giving me a chance to really taste what it's like to be I was living in fear. I had fearful people around me. There was no social grounding. My grandparents hadn't spoken to, to each other for about 30 years. I was ungrounded. I was floating. I was also in the air. There was no sense of support. Yeah. So fear, fear, fear for me was a normal thing. Mm. And the, the dream brought, uh, brought home this, this, uh, this sense that I really had to normalize fear because it was part of the environment. It wasn't something I could flee from without getting my needs on that. Yeah. So I think for me, fear became my constant companion. So as a Gestaltist, I find that fear is an energy, but it doesn't really exist. Fear does not really exist because if I'm truthful, all those times I've, I've had fearful times, I haven't felt fear when I've been in crisis, in, in car crashes or, or in fights, or in um, sense of life, life and death settings. I haven't felt fear then. I felt fear before thinking about what might happen. Mm. I felt fear waking up and not knowing what, what, what the, the uh, day might bring and having something challenging ahead. I felt fear following an event when I felt I was doing something dangerous. But during the time, there was no fear. So my Gestalt take on that is that fear is really a fantasy. We are haunting ourselves. Mm. It is mainly an imagination. So fear is something I put between where I am now and where I imagine I might end up if things go wrong. So, so in that sense, fear, fear of flying is haunting yourself by the worst possible outcome. It's, it's not happening now. You aren't there in it, but you're imagining. So it's like running your own imaginary mo uh, movie about what might happen if the worst happens. It's your, uh, your own personalized drama. Mm. And it's all for your sake. But it's coming from somewhere. Fear doesn't just, just happen from nowhere. We, we, we don't have these things without there being a need. And the, the organistic need or kind of core need of, of, of the body is to express the, the unexpressed if that need builds up. So if you have fear of flying, you have fear of something else, guaranteed. And I'm sure you've had lots of time in life to build up the sense of fear and to know it well. So fear of flying is just one more out, outlet, this inborn, intrinsic fear that you're holding. So for, for you then, it sounds like it's it's more, more of a symptom of something bigger going on. Is that what it, you're it's saying? Part of your, yes, it, it, it's a part, part of your life for you. Your, your life has a, has, a, has a whole range of elements and it's one more element. One, one more of your personal stance. So your fear of flying, but the actual odds are, like when I looked up the actual odds of planes crashing, there weren't e e enough crashes to have decent stance. The airline is so rarely crashed that there's no decent statistical profile. So it's not something tangible that's just every day. Much more fear ought to be had about driving a car, crossing a road. Many people die inside. Their, their, their home in bed, fear of going to sleep, you know. <laughs> There's more fear. Ooh, there's a new fear for you. <laughs> the likelihood of not waking up from, uh, from sleeping is far, 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 far higher than ever dreaming about a plane crashing. Like, so why do you go and put that in my head now? That's, that's going <laughs> to... There'll be people listening now. Like, <laughs> yeah. You're providing an alternative fear, yeah? yeah? Yeah, you're normalizing. Okay, so... Fear. Fear, fear is normal. Mm. And it's also like death. Death is normal. Part of the actual payoff for life is like death. Spike Milligan said, life is one long disease caused by death. That life always throws up challenges. It always throws up something to meet you. The challenges are challenges of learning, adaptation. Mm. Now, whether you take the excitement you have as a normal living person walking towards your, your challenges, or interpret it as fear is up to you. But fear in, in raw base is just excitement. And it's saying, stay aware, stay alert, mm. be interested, be on guard. 
but it's not fear. It is not fear in 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 that sense of fear have something intrinsic to scare you with. It's just a fantasy about about you haunting yourself with your own sort of reds. So if somebody came towards you uh, <clears throat> with with a fear of flying, I, you, you probably have treated all sorts of things over your because also you're training lots of different approaches as well. But I know Gestalt is your kind of your core yeah. thing that you've written about as well. What what would you do with somebody who has okay. a fear of flying? What would you recommend? Can I use, can I, can I use you as my guinea pig? Oh, crap. Who... All right, go on then. <laughs> oh, okay. oh, sorry, I've got a bad signal. I'll have to hang up. <laughs> go on then. How convenient. Fear How convenient. of... Uh, yeah, go on then. All right. So, so let's e e imagine you're, you're fearful of flying. You, 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 you will come to me. Okay, I, I want to know, first of all, when did this fear start? thinking about a lot of people sometimes people have a, a, a point they'll say i think it was then but yeah. most don't actually know it creep even those that think it was a specific flight i think it can often creep up on them and they've perhaps been not thinking about it but they're, they're sort of secretly aware of it you know so it's sort of creep so they may not know i don't know i'll say i don't know so i, I i'll then wonder about where in your body do you normally store your fear mm. Like many, many people get fear mainly inside the stomach, which I don't. Yeah. But I'm wondering about where you store your fear. Uh, for me, I think it's in my chest. Okay. That's near in mine. I, I think mine's in my breathing. Mm. So very, very quickly, we have other way in, don't we? Like uh, we can pretend and act into being afraid by breathing in a certain way. And maybe make friends with fear that way, panting. Yeah. Well, we, uh, well, we how, does, your... how does that help then? Well, by, by, uh, by panting, you're giving your body the actual sense of what it's like, like to be fearful, running. Right. Flight or fight, straining. But breathing is a, a very important sort of way in or way out. But the key is also the way out. Because by controlling breathing and by breathing down deeper, as I'm doing now, my excitement goes somewhat down and my voice is changing. Mm. When I'm breathing down, I feel much more grounded. I don't feel as excited or curious. So I'm, I'm, I'm now suddenly aware that in, in this podcast so far, I've been breathing high, almost with a wish to energize myself. Yeah. But if I breathe low and get solid, like, like all, all the meditation breathing for years and years, people have known, breathe deep, breathe from your, from your harrow or navel, and something happens. So you, you come inside, and I might want you to then uh, to pant, to enter panting, get a sense of what it's like to feel the feel, fear, how you feel your fear. Mm. And during, during that time of feeling your fear, I probably want you to look at, well, well, Paul, what memories do you tend to have linked in with fear? When in your life do fearful times stand out? Where are they? When are they? So the idea being then, so if, if it, so if that was mine for the fear of flying, I'd be as I was panting. You would, you would imagine then that the thoughts would be coming in as well. I, I'd imagine following this, there might be something where you might have memories, mm. but you might walk in cold. And I might even say then, okay, sit down, give me a sense of sometimes in your in your life when you felt fear. When were these? So uh, so Paul, I said to you. What is your first sort of clear memory of fear? There's nothing uh, Okay, first clear memory of fear. <clears throat> well, I had loads of different ones then. So I'll just set, I'll, I'll settle on one. Yeah. I'll settle on one, I've got an early adult one. So first job was in the military. Okay, yeah. Yeah. And there was loads of times that I mean there were others before, but they're a bit more fuzzy. But this one, these are really clear ones because of good. the fear of, you know, will I be good enough? Can I get through this? You know, the basic training is was pr pretty tough, and also, I you know I think people are drawn to those sort of professions to to fulfil some other need. But I couldn't see that at the time. I was just it was just about satisfying other people. I think and, right. and so then the. Yeah. Yeah. Can I 
just in, in a second. So it sounds like your fears were, were a socialized one or, or social. Mm. About can you fit in? Can you be enough? Will you be enough? Yeah. We're talking about survival in a kind of life or death sense. We're more like a fear around uh, can I belong? So then I wonder about, about, about your family, about how you felt within your family, because they you start and they grow and they build up and store them up. And I wonder in your family, how you felt in terms of belonging. Did, did, did you feel like you belonged there or were there times when you felt, as we all do, in the actual way you're not quite seen and heard? You know? Yeah, well, definitely for me, I, my humour, is yeah. was the kind of a was a link mm. for my family situation but it also enabled it's become something which is yeah. like a, something a go-to that i use now so it's a it's a, it was a survival tactic then that's actually mm. has some positive sides as well so think, think of you being a, being a child with a with a bag and in that bag you put all all those fears Sometimes you put all those fears that people say, you can't be that, don't be like that, that's not manly. Mm. Grow up, stop being like that. And by the age of about 10 or 12, you've got a bag that's getting bigger and bigger, with more, more fears and stuff. Yeah. And if the body is storing things up, uh, it's gonna need some way of explaining these fears. And if you aren't a sporting type, you don't have a kind of physical outlet, it's gonna come up in somatic body health way. But somehow or somewhere, you're going to have to express these feelings because we aren't a balloon. We, 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 we burst with so much energy going on. Yeah, yeah. So it's like we're, we're laying down the time button feelings if they aren't expressed. That's really interesting. So when I sort of step back at that now, before I start going into therapy with you, I get this sense of we started with something now. Yeah. Uh, and you've mm. gone sort of bodily, what's going on for you physically. Then you've yeah. gone to the thoughts and then you've gone linked back to yeah. a sort of a route and then gone back. That's really interesting. And that you did that quite quickly. Human being is very, very complex and we have all these links. So when I work with, when I work with people, I don't have a plan. I tend to work with what they bring. Mm. And I work in a phenomenological way, which means I stay with what is unfolding. And I follow that because I think the roots of where people are coming from can be traced back by looking at how they're making sense now. Yeah. What I've done more than I normally do here, I've been leading you, but normally I'd wait for you in silences or we've had times where I yes. ask you to, to reminisce or to mm. think about the past and then see what comes, comes up that day. Yeah. Because, because the body has a kind of inbuilt system wisdom of meeting its own needs and if I'm patient enough and if I'm with you long enough your body and mind will uncover yourself for me to help you mm. and I can help you by being a mirror by mirroring back things or by picking things up or by making links or giving you you kind of clues that, I, that I've learned from other clients who also feel fear and I can read myself and share my own fears and compare contrast it's like doing research into the experience of the experience we're having. That is Gestalt. Mm. It's not a theory you nor know, kind of plan or a practice way or doing certain routines or, or working in a behavioral, purely edu educational way, because that's like bright. It's more of a, an experiential exploring mm. of what's happening now. Yeah, so I felt like there you were with me trying to unpick it that's what it felt like on the you know that was just a very light touch i mean we've done this type of stuff before but you've done the fuller version but i appreciate yeah. you not doing the silences because that's not a great podcast <laughs> listening <laughs> um, so i can't relax i'm on show the whole damn time I, I, yes I'm do some magic here. paul come on okay yeah yeah but i think so i think so if somebody even who's listening to this who's who's really stuck yeah. with this fear of flying and sometimes they're, they're just desperate i don't believe there are any quick fixes there aren't any quick fixes apart from walking towards the fears in safe ways mm. learning about fear maybe making fear fear your friend so talk could tell me a bit about the walking towards fear in safe ways because you've talked about that yourself 
that might be quite interesting. Okay, I was beaten up as a kid quite often, so I joined martial art clubs where I learned to walk towards my fear. And we had really good teachers who taught us defensive techniques before they taught us the attacking techniques. So we learned how to defend ourselves, how to dodge, how to block. Mm. And one to one, one to two, one to three against a knife, you can feel quite scared. But if, if it's also this time with play, so you're playing at being in dangerous places. So, so play sounds really important because play is a way of facing your fears without being in danger or without mm. being in fearful places. So how, how much you make your fear a playmate rather than a, a big beast of a thing? So, so I have this fear. I, I do have one last fear, which, which I haven't walked towards yet. There's a big Ferris wheel upon the, upon the kids' park, right, uh, uh, quite near here. I haven't gone up in it yet. Mm. I've said, no, thanks, no. And I have that resistance, and it's that travelling up, that losing con contact. Uh, concrete connection with uh, with ground. They're coming down easy as hell. And I've been on kind of chair lifts and things, and I've been on lots of ski lifts, and I haven't had that fear so much. But the fear going up and then plattering, flying, and coming down great. But I, I still have it here. So part of me is a bit out of practice at going up and feeling safe going. Mm. If I think way, way back, uh, the first time I flew was to Mauritius. It was a 24-hour flight, 1960s, and we changed planes many times. And I thought I'd be scared. I thought I'd be scared. But what happened was I began to get very curious. Mm. So, so when, when, when the plane was, was taking off, I was so curious about what's happening here. Mm. I stayed focused upon the noises, the, the whole feeling of it, the kind of rhythm of it. When when the plane took off, the sense of 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 outside the window, seeing the actual scenery changing. So I uh, somehow I, I overcame my fears instinctively by by being curious, by taking interest, and focusing elsewhere. I focused upon the the experience other than fear. So never ever again any fear of flying. Interested. So I found a way for me of making friends with uh, fear being interested. And I find yeah. these days when I'm meeting something fearful, like recently doing, doing, doing a podcast with about 70 people or going before a large group and doing a, a workshop and I'll, I'll go out there and I'll play with, with it. I'll talk about how I'm feeling. I'm feeling now like, how do I start? What might happen here? And if I go into my fears, I think it's going to be a failure. I shall go anywhere. But I know inside me that if I'm if I'm grounded, if I breathe down deeply, if I really connect with you, there'll be something happening. And if I really connect with, with people magically. Mm. And likewise, if I really connect with any experience here and now, and this is this is very good now, so please excuse me. To be here and now is to be grounded, is to be really inside the moment. And the moment's all we really have. So all my life I've been attuning to being inside the moment without putting myself, my fears, my fantasies distractions in the actual way. So when I've been in pain, I wanted to be in that pain rather than to pretend it's not there. Mm. When I've been in my dis uh, discomfort zone, I wanted to be there to learn about what am I doing to make the pain better or worse. I remember way, going, uh, way, way back, going through a, um, an operation when my diaphragm burst. And the way of stopping pain for me was to go with it. Not, not to fight it, fight it made it worse. But if I listened to it and breathed in the way it needed, if I stayed with it, even though at times it got so bad I couldn't focus, I was like losing my consciousness. If I allowed myself to flow rather than to kind of fight, things got easier and easier. And I think that took away my fear of death too, because um, it's just like letting go. Mm. Can I learn to let go in life so I can give up my best in, in a relaxed, flowing way? I wonder, during times of stress. Yeah. So I had all these things going on for me. Yeah, I was, I, 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 there's lots of stuff there. Sorry, keep, no, don't let me interrupt okay, you. That's sorry. good stuff. No, no, no it's good. Please, I, no. I, I, 
I, I do like you to use. I do like you to interrupt me because that's spontaneous stuff. It, yeah. It's not practiced. So, so yeah. you'll, you'll be. Okay, I let me just redo roll. that spontaneous interruption then. Okay, I'm ready. Start oh, you're ready now, now for the spontaneous in the moment interruption. <laughs> Paul, let me ask a question. Dr. Paul Barber, I was really struck by that thing about staying in the moment that you've, yeah. and that you've really concentrate on being in the moment. And, mm -hmm. and I thought that sounded really interesting, particularly the, uh, I like the idea of being sort of curious about and being interested in what's happening. And I was just yeah. thinking, how can that, I can see some links there for the fear of flying. But I'm just, okay. I want them sort of, I, I, like, I like them to be a bit bigger so I can, okay. yeah. If I'm fully inside the moment, I have no time to fantasize about fear. Mm. You, you get the idea there. Yeah, but how do you do that though? So if you are, so, so to be, so I'm, I'm on an aircraft, I'm feeling claustrophobic and I want to get off. Yeah. How would I, use that and is there a way to practice it beforehand perhaps Be, uh, beforehand if, if i was fear, fear, fearful of flying i want to go to to relaxation classes yoga classes i want to learn and train myself to handle my breathing so it goes down and stays deep and rhythmic rather than goes up and high because mm. well, the more higher i go the more on ground i feel the more flying i am yeah but the more i'm solid inside my thorax the more i feel like solid up on the earth I'd also socially want to ground myself by seeing if I can keep in conversation with, with someone while, while, while the plane is taking off. I'd like to sit and talk and talk about things, saying what's happening and be curious about them, and hold them in conversation. I maybe also want to distract myself away from the kind of emotional stuff by having crosswords or having a really engrossing book or having something that gives me a different focus okay it might help too to have a, a sort of a stiff drink be beforehand so i can relax myself but some people go even more kind of ungrounded without drinking fly off and feel even more fear but know yourself what mm. works for you you might even want to go to a doctor and get a kind of anti-anxiety sometimes just to have it is enough you don't have to take it yes yeah but if I can walk upon a plane and, and stay in, in the actual moment, be aware of things, keep my breathing still, focus on, on what's happening around me, I can do a lot in not, feel, not feeling the fear, not being immersed by fear, not being flooded, drowning, overwhelmed by fear. Mm. I might too want to take things with me, like uh, a talisman or photographs of people I love. If I'm religious, I, I, I might want to pray beforehand or, or have a personal prayer or mantra, which I can repeat to myself, which helps me ground. So these things the are thing. used to ground rather than sort of rituals that have oh, yeah. to be observed. Yes, you have to ground. Purposeful things are helping you to ground. You might want to go the full hog and make fears with, with death be <laughs> before you fly. <laughs> yes? Like... <laughs> We know we will die one day. That supposedly is the worst thing that can happen. Though maybe, maybe it's not because the people I, I, I've been with when they've died uh, haven't found it the worst thing ever. Mm. The worst thing is when they didn't feel they belonged or they were failing or they had shame or they let themselves down. When they were dying, they found ways of accepting, relaxing. And then the worst never happens because you're normally unconscious before you die so you don't you don't feel yourself losing breath you don't feel yourself anywhere else than in some sort of place where often you're suspended and you're you're somewhere else different conscious level mm. so the worst never happens the worst never happens we aren't there when the worst happens so what's that say about fear about the imaginary thing about fear again well, I guess ultimately, fear of flying, regardless of how it manifests itself, whether it's turbulence, yeah. uh, claustrophobia, mm. you know, wanting to escape, the ultimate, the root of it has to be that fear of dying, doesn't it, to some level? But the, the, the fear of dying itself is at root of fear of something else. It might be a certain 
personality form you have, a certain support system. You might be a person who really has to have control. And any amount of not having control brings out this fear. Mm. And many, many people who, who, who will come from very disturbed childhood are so shit scared of being without control because they don't have trust in themselves or trust in others. Yeah. So for them, fear of flying may be more about reawakening their early childhood mistrust, childhood phobias. So it's like, it may surface as a fear of flying or a fear of this or a fear of that. But it's been taught elsewhere. Sometimes children learn fear from their parents. Mm. They've been socialized by habit to being fearful, to having that fearfulness around them. Yeah. Like, if I said to you, Paul, who inside your family was, was the, the one who was teaching you fear most? Uh, my mum. Your mum, yeah. That's yeah. very common. So common. Yeah. The, the, the uh, women, the, the mothers who don't have the the power inside the old-fashioned families were the ones who were most fearful because they felt the most powerless. Mm. And we're raised by our mothers, so it's quite likely we're carrying her fear for her in many ways, or carrying her fear in us. Mm. Because we also always have this, this memory of the inner child, the child we once were. And when we aren't being adults or feeling adult, that's where we go back to the time, that fearful child. Yeah. The, the, before we put on that kind of mantle, that mask of being the adult, in control, knowing it all, mm. competent. Yeah, yeah. So here, here's one more thing. How do we nurture and support the inner child in us that's feeling, that, that's feeling this fear? Because that might be also one more way of going. And if we aren't there for the inner child in, inside us, then how do we support ourselves? Mm. Times these are, sound quite tricky concepts to to wrestle yeah. with. It doesn't sound like something you could do on your own. I, I might be wrong. Well, you can you can you can learn at your your most vulnerable in your most vulnerable place inside you that feels the most childlike. What keeps you supported? It might even be food, like uh, as, as a child, I, I couldn't eat. I was vomiting the whole time. So, so for, uh, for me, food wasn't comforting, but, but I had this rabbit's ear from my grandfather, who was a hunter. And just by kind of rubbing it, that texture mm. of that food rabbit's ear, that kept me soothed. So I wonder also about fear of flying. If I could have some repetitive movements or something about a texture. So touch to me was one more way into feeling secure and safe. And that's a very grounding thing, isn't it? Because it's it, yeah. Yeah. so mm -hmm. feeling like so people often grip the armrest, but if you were to feel the armrest, the texture of it yeah. and really yeah. notice it, then you'd be in that moment, wouldn't you? But rather than yeah. yeah. And even to group to uh, to uh, to grip your own hand, grip them together. Feel yourself. Keep clenching, keep Clenching, unclenching, feel yourself, feel your own power there moving around. You know, it's, that's also a contact too. Mm. And you, you know how people who are fearful holding on to others, they can hold them so tight, they bruise. Maybe take something to, to, to squeeze with you too, to hold on tight with. Because your, your instinctive, hist uh, historic animal in, inside you wants to grip. We, we came from monkeys so quite often. We want to grip tight. When scared, we, we really want to grip something tight. So mm. it's almost like uh, not just the inner child, but the inner mammal inside us from which we evolved needs that sort of activity too. Become the inner monkey paw. <laughs> grip something. <laughs> just safe. Dr. Paul Barber's top tip, become the inner <laughs> monkey. <laughs> and grip someone. <laughs> yeah. Notice how I'm playing a lot here because I must have some fear around if I let myself have it about this podcast. I, I didn't know what the hell was going on. I, 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 blamed, I, I blamed, benched on myself with ideas, but I didn't have a kind of plan or a safety net. So I think I use humor in such a way as to convert the, what fear I, ha I had into an expressive mm. excitement. 
So maybe like you when I was younger, which I think I did being a Northerner, I convert my fears into humour. Yeah. I haven't noticed your humour yet, but I guess it'll come through at some point. Oh, yeah, yeah. Maybe it will when you're here and now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I like I like that because there's because uh, some of those things you said, yeah, are interesting because there, there's a ritualistic element to them which I normally say to people: be careful of getting into rituals because they become things which yeah. you have to do. But actually, some of the ones you've described, there there probably could be a ritualistic element to them, but they are deliberately grounding rather yeah. than keeping you safe rituals like pretend safe. Yeah. They're like in the here and now type safe, aren't they? Yeah. If, I, if I'm interpreting them correctly. Many people feel safe once they've written their will, like they've completed all of these things before they face something fearful. <laughs> Did you do that before the podcast? No, I didn't. I'm sorry I missed out on that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, there is people this thing about getting things in order, isn't there? I guess there's yeah. a, maybe there's that. Yeah. People who are control freaks want to write their will, don't they? To get it all right, be, 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 before they face an extinction. People who are, who are fearful of not fitting in because um, they haven't done it, done it correctly or right want to write their will, don't they? Mm. They want to make sure I'm doing it properly. Which is fear of rejection again, isn't it? Fear of rejection, not doing it properly. Well, I'll bow down to experience on that. I don't know because. I don't think I'm particularly controlling or that, you know, that I'm aware of. Certainly there are some things yeah. I like to be in control of, but I don't, not to that level. Yeah. What about then, because actually that's remind me of something. When, when mm. people go through turbulence, mm. many have said to me, I don't like it. It feels like it's out of control. Yeah. So what would be, so someone's going through, someone's got nervous fly, obviously, can, comes towards turbulence what would be the gestalt way of dealing with that go into it more go into it really feel it get a sense of where in your body you're, you're feeling that mm. get a sense of what images come up at the same time as the turbulence look at how you're breathing change your breathing see if that helps look at how you're sitting how how supported are you by the seat you're on, mm. or are you first upon the edge, the edge of the seat? How can you get more support from your environment? So we all get scared going up on a roller coaster, going through the movement, the turbulence there, and we call it fun. Yet we, we go in the play and we call it fear. See this this tiny movement between play and fear, fun and yeah. fear. Yeah. So how we how we interpret it. So I want to fly to a kind of tropical island to have my holiday. That's worth going through some discomfort for. So I want the, I want the holiday to be where I want to be more than I want to scare myself off by not flying. And I can I can think myself through that. And I can feel my, myself through that. And I know there's there's always a cost to pay for anything challenging. Mm. Discomfort. So if I can let go of my control needs and feel a bit more discomfort and maybe practice putting myself in discomforting places like, okay, here's one you'll like. A client of mine who was scared of being, being in the public felt he was always being seen and laughed at and pointed at. Cure, homework. Take a big inflatable banana and go up on the tube during rush hour. <laughs> <laughs> now... <laughs> He, he didn't even need to do that. We talked about doing it. And we got to a stage where he could have done it. But by that time, he didn't need to do it. But he put himself through it all, yeah? He, de he, he desensitized himself to all this predestined fear. <laughs> this is what you call therapy, is it? Oh, they people pay for oh, this. <laughs> well, my, my form of therapy is not my, the analyst. I get the clients to analyze themselves. If need be, I play with them. If need be, I walk alongside them. If need be, I share my compassion for them, my, my interest with them. Mm. But they come to their own conclusions, which suit them better. I don't impose things on them. Mm. I have lots of ideas. 
but it's for them to find the wrong way forward. Otherwise, if they're doing it, doing it my way, it won't work for them. No. You must find their way through. I, I like that. It's very individualised, isn't it? Yeah. Something going back to the turbulence thing, you were very much... There was a real spirit of experimenting with it. Where am I sitting? Yeah. How can I get make feel myself more secure? What's going on? What am I feeling? Where am I noticing it? What's my breathing doing? Yeah. I got a set, so you're really going into the moment rather than yeah. Because what I know with a lot of fearful flyers will do is particularly during turbulences they'll start you know they might just look down and start uh, rocking or you know, they could get really upset or they start imagining all sorts of stuff and you're actually doing the, you're advocating first the exact mistake. opposite first mistake come out and meet the environment being inside the environment here and now is the best remedy come safety you have mm. being really present if i'm really present the worst never happens if my imagination comes in then i i haunt myself with my own nightmare yeah yeah also, simple physical things like um, to discharge yourself from fear. Take a strong mint, a strong ginger. Have that. Take chewing gum, something that is, that is expressing a movement. Physical things work too. You know, it's it's like just fine for you. What 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 what's the best for, mm. for you? You know, be it prayer, be it strong chewing, be it movement, be it distraction through mental activity. Find the best way for you, be the socialization. The best thing for me normally or for anybody I've met, number one is stay in dialogue with yeah. yourself and with others during whatever you're going through that's, that, that is stressful. So that's my number one tip, not the no. banana. Not the banana. So bananas are optional, the inflatable well, banana. Well, forget about the banana, yeah. Yeah, on your next flight, take a large banana with you. Uh, staying in dialogue. I, I think there's some... Yeah. I know that I was seeing quite a few people in the Facebook group that I do, the Love Fly Facebook group, mm, yeah. that have said that quite often they've tricked themselves into liking flying because they've seen somebody on board an aircraft who's been upset and they end up talking to them and they forget yeah. that they're scared. Yeah. Great. They? great, 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 great. Perfect way. Do mm. something. Be in dialogue. Be connected. Cement your contact with, with the the environment you're in, because the more you feel out of touch, alienated, like 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 my dream of uh, flying inside the actual car, I was getting higher and higher and higher, away further and further and further from the earth. Mm. The more I'm I'm ungrounded, the more fear can seep in. So the more you can ground yourself, the less fear seeps in. Do something else. Yeah. Feel the fear by all means, but do something else. Feel, yeah. feel the fear and do it anyway. What the hell? It's only fear. I think somebody's already written that. <laughs> <laughs> Feel the fear and buy yourself a large inflatable banana. There's a book in that, Paul, I think. Wow, okay. You, I you heard it here first, yeah. You know, <laughs> you're quite a prolific writer, so I'm sure you can knock that out by the weekend. Wow, you have more faith in me than I have in me. I'm liking this because it's it's different to what other people... There's some elements that cross over, like the breathing thing seems to come through time of everyone I've spoken to whether it's a, no matter what yeah. their discipline is it seems to be a, a central theme mm -hmm. but what I feel from the gestalt approach mm -hmm. from what I can tell is yeah. that you are very much like in the here and now grounded embrace it move towards it be curious interested know it, yes. know it yeah so I'm doing the research I'll be at the same time aren't I if I'm researching I'm not Scaring myself by scaring myself. I'm, I'm doing. I'm doing the, in, the inquiry, but I, I, I really too. I, I, I do the hands-on inquiry. If I was really scared of flying, look at the stats. Look at the, you know, the, I, I tried that. There's like this minimal. There's rarely a crash. So then you start to think, why the hell am I carrying this? It can't be. It's, it's not factual. It's not real. It's not commonplace. So it can't just be this. I'm doing it for. It must be something inside me rather than something on the outside. Because I've never heard of someone who died in an, an air crash. I've heard of tons of people died in car crashes. Yeah. So if I'm here for flying, it's not just the flying. It's not just that going on. It's, I'm, I'm curious about what more might, might be going on in, inside me to give me the sphere.
and maybe maybe the staying grounded and staying with can can start the 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 uh, the night before by having good solid meaningful authentic conversations with your nearest and dearest yes. and talking about it talking about it if you don't talk about fear you give it more kind of energy because you you hide it somewhere to to grow all by itself like that bag of fears i was talking about the kid having so by the age of 30 if, if you if you haven't looked at the fears in inside your life just put them inside the black bag the bag is now twice your size and you're dragging it behind you there's something about the talking about the fear though there's one of the things i know that i see a lot is that they do talk about the fears but they talk about it in a certain way and so i wonder if there's a sort of a helpful so for example they tend to repeat and that's quite a normal thing i think for people who are scared of flying they sort of rehearse the same thing so when you're talking about it you're it sounds like you're talking about a different version of being in dialogue well if i was talking about fear i want to if my client was talking about fear in, in a fearful way, I want to say, well, now, now just describe it without feeling it. Now describe it and feel it. Now describe it, but feel more distant from it. Now describe it and describe it with humor. Like, oh God, I'm, I'm really fearful. Oh shit. I'm really kind of shitting myself here when I even think about flying. Goodness gracious. You know, so practice it. Practice talking about it in different ways. Also, something which I find useful too is to perceive the world in different ways. Like, if I perceive you now through my eyes, if I breathe in through my eyes, breathe out through my eyes, and, and look, at, look at you, and sort of take you in that way, then if I move down, breathe through my heart, breathing in through my heart, out through my heart, I start to feel you more. And as in my eyes, I think about you more, but when I go down to my heart and breathe through my heart, out to you and back, I start to have a bond building. If I go down to my navel, and breathe in, in and out through my navel, while also looking to you and staying with you, an amazing calmness comes over me. Well, there's a placement thing you're doing there, so that that would be a, for some people listening to this who are very logical they'll struggle with what you just said but i know other listeners will totally get it that you're I, you don't, I, I don't, don't breathe care. through your eyes you're imagining it, aren't you yeah, yeah. I, I don't care but they must do it because what i'm saying yeah. is do the experiment and find out for yourself yeah don't believe a damn thing i'm saying chuck is outside the window but do the experiment and find out yeah. for yourself if it works or not it may not work for you but if you stay at it long enough your body never lies. Your body never lies. Only your body. So when you're fear, fearful, quite often your breathing goes back. Well, then it means you, 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 you need more air. So try breathing, try breathing deeper and taking in more air and more in, more in breath. And then practice with the fear, breathing out the fear. Breathe in the here and now, the solidarity without the fear. Like, like, like often in, in times of, of disconnection, I, I invite people to breathe in love and breathe out the fear for themselves. And it tends to help to put them in touch with them. Yeah. But so, many, so few people have a good dialogue with themselves. Like, here's one more, one more I, I, I did before I go. Sit down in front of an empty chair, put fear on the chair and ask fear the questions you have. You know, why did you come to me? What's happening? And then imagine yourself answering from fear's position. Maybe ask questions like, how can I befriend you? How can I come alongside you rather than push you away, be scared of you? How can I use you to support me rather than to scare me? See what fear says. So there's this dialogue and staying here now, staying with and bearing your soul, even to an empty chair can be useful. The empty chair technique is, is classic. You start, I'm always embarrassed doing it. You talking to you works. Yeah, you giving yourself a, a good talking to, a good feeling to, a good sort of even knowing works. Yeah, I like the fact that 
So from that, I haven't thought, no one's said that before. I'm familiar with the empty chair technique, but I've never heard anybody think about putting your fear in the chair opposite you and ask it what it wants. So it's befriending it. That's what it sounds like to me. So it's, it's a part of you. So you're talking directly to it. So we are limited only by our imagination, aren't we? And if I'm playful, I am imaginative. So I tend to stay playful where possible with clients. When I'm not playful, I, I tend to be compassionate because they are echoing a part of the human condition which I can relate to, empathize with. And if I can show them empathy, I can show myself empathy when I get tangled up and fucked up, can't I? Yeah. And it's all about learning about who we are on this journey. Yes, and it is a journey, isn't it? So it's like, mm. and it's thwarted if you can't do something that you're wanting to do. That this fear becomes such a big thing, it stops you yeah. progressing. It could be that's the reason why you've got to face it. But it's, and I've yeah. I, I've helped people who've just literally changed their lives. Yeah. And one one particular individual, I remember her name. Never went on the course or anything. She just had put off doing anything for about thirty odd years. Sure. and had kids and hadn't been anywhere with them and then just one day decided to just take herself on a flight and then we talked about mm. it afterwards mm. and now she flies all the time she's been able to take a job which involves flying which is just crazy isn't it that so yeah. if she'd not done that then that that avenue that door would never opened you know i don't know why i said avenue but that door wouldn't have opened but no also avenue. one more thing comes up Two for me. Readiness, a person being ready. Mm. We can't force it on them if they aren't ready. And no. as much as therapy, as a, as, a, as a therapist, I prepare people in such a way as they get themselves ready to hearing more, going deeper. You can't just go there. You have to build up a bridge of trust. Like, like you, you know, as, as a facilitator of fear flying, you've got to build up trust before people can start to hear you. Because in fear, Hearing goes first. People don't hear you. On first meeting, people don't hear you. So when I'm talking to clients, I have to repeat myself again and again and again when they come inside the nervous anxious vehicle because it's the nature of the beast. And in fear, we aren't listening to ourselves or hearing ourselves, which makes us even more fearful because we're out of contact. Mm. I'll tell you what, this has got me thinking a lot. And I reckon that people, when they listen back to this one, yeah, I was expecting to think. (laughs) (laughs) They'll put a little warning out of the podcast. Thinking may be required. Yeah. If you had to give like your one tip, you know, the big tip, the big Paul Barber, I've been doing this for yonks, faced a lot of my own fears, helped a lot of people their fears. What would your one tip be? Accept how things are. Let things be. Stop trying to be. Stop trying to make a big difference. Come home to yourself. One of the Buddhist laws is that we make ourselves discontent by attaching ourselves too much to things. That the greatest the greatest suffering we have is by, by being too attached too attached to life, too attached to ourself, too attached to ego. Just be here and now. Much of what I'm saying is also Zen. Gestalt is very Zen, being inside the here and now, mm. building awareness, staying conscious, alert, not becoming over, over attached to, to how you are, what you're doing, how you're being, if people are seeing you or not, or if they're liking you. When you're so important to the audience, when you feel that you have to please the audience, you give all of the other people power over you. When you try to fit in, you give all other people power over you. When you're just content to be, you can go and join them alongside as an, as an equal, rather than trying to fit in or trying to be something you're not. So I'm here now and I can be with you. But I don't have to try hard to get you to like me or to... Uh, to be something for you, it's not important. Mm. But I can just, I can just, just, just be me. I think I can resonate with enough energy, interest, 
seriousness in you that you can be at ease with me yeah very thought-provoking stuff paul oh i'm sorry yes no it's good you're you're, you're a lot wiser than i realized i think thinking gets in the way of wisdom personally <laughs> it's all related yeah the intellect we, we we've been taught to to go to, to our to, to our, our intellect to solve problems forget it it's not the best place to be where is it then just in just in, in that sense of being and being with yourself and if you're in touch with your environment you're being very contact contactful and safe you're keeping yourself safe by being in touch with the environment seeing what's coming knowing what's coming responding to normally but if you're thinking about the audience and trying to be something else you don't see what's coming you you, you blind spot yourself if you try, try to avoid your fears you blind spot yourself with your fears inside that black bag and gets bigger and bigger you blind spot yourself you take away your energy fears and energizer yes it is I think I've done now. I think that's roughly about Yeah, it. I think I think you've um you might have peaked there. Well, without ever knowing it. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, that was brilliant. Thank you so much. I'm really grateful for your time. Obviously, I've known you a long time and it's it's a little it's interesting to sort of approach this conversation this in mind and just to see your you've done the gestalt, but also there's all those years of just living with it yourself. I think that's been really interesting and a, a, and a nice addition to the podcast. So thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me.